Oh, wait, we got somebody. Oh, yeah, look at that. Talking permitted, it says, so. Oh, I just clicked it. Oh yeah, and I had a little window pop up for that person. So okay. I'm just looking at a row. Welcome, Astrid. If you can hear us, we're gonna just wait a few more minutes and see if anyone shows up. Do you have any snow right now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but lots of snow. <clears throat> it is bright and sunny out today. Let's see what temperature is outside. It's 57. It's a little chilly. Got somebody else in with a who I can't identify right now. Maybe you can. You said you could do that last time. Oh, yes, Daniel. Welcome back. Just hover over the name. It doesn't pop up a little box for you with the email address? No, not for me. But you're in the participants list? In the participants list. No. I think only because you're the host right now, so. Yeah, you should be able to do it. On this, you see this? I don't know what you mean by see this. I can't see what you're doing, so. Um, so right now we're just kind of like waiting on a few more folks and then we'll just sort of jump into it in a minute. Still almost one o'clock. Thanks for joining us. Is that dog going to sleep in the background the whole time, just teasing us that, that we can't be relaxing on the couch? You could be relaxing on your couch. No one would know. All right, Sadie. We have another person joining us. Welcome. Welcome to the program. What kind of coffee you got today, Mike? You got your Watch mama? No, because you didn't send me any new ones. Oh, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> we will give it just a few more minutes. Thanks for hanging in there.
at least the uh, link to get here worked this time. Forgot about that. All right, Paul, maybe we should just jump into some stuff since we're uh, yeah, let's do it. only got a half hour. Uh, so the three folks, we just lost Jennifer, I believe. Maybe. No, nope, there she is. And she's back. Okay, so we're going to jump right in a little bit. I think the three folks with us today have been with us the past two times, so that's great, um, which means that you saw us when we talked about the emergency response binder and about safety and security trainings. Um, today, we wanted to touch base on bringing all these, these two big pieces, which are not the only pieces, but those two pieces together into what we call your holistic loss prevention program. Um, a, a lot of you might know that big box stores around the country have had loss prevention departments for years. Those are big box stores. They have a lot of resources to invest, whether it's you know Walmarts or Targets or any of these stores, they have dedicated teams to do loss prevention, undercover, overt. Um, they have camera systems. They have, uh, what are those things called in front of the store, Paul? EAS. Um, EAS systems. They have all kinds of systems in place, and they're constantly working towards preventing loss um, and improving safety and security in their stores. Co-ops are not big box stores. We're much smaller entities. So what we decided to do was take a lot of those basic uh, systems and scale them down into something that makes sense for co-ops to put into place. The one thing that, they, that the big box stores do that we also need to think about doing is whether or not we create a loss prevention specific department. We need to find staff that we can charge with loss prevention, safety and security responsibilities dedicated staff to work on those issues. When we don't have that, we've noticed that not a lot of this stuff gets done. Um, that's true for trainings like we talked about last week. A lot of you probably have you know, set trainers in your store and so the trainings get done. If you didn't and it was kind of a wishy-washy thing, who was gonna do a training when, they probably wouldn't happen. So loss prevention staff comes at the top of our list. We thought about opening up the conversation with asking you folks what you had in place already with regards to loss prevention. That hasn't worked for us in the past uh, two times we've tried this because we only have about a half hour and we recognize that a lot of you were probably in some shared workspace where um, you might not want to you know, turn on your microphone. So that's fine. We're just going to sort of talk at you. But if you do have a question and you don't want to chime in using your microphone, you can use the little chat function and you can write us a note. Um, it doesn't beep at me, but hopefully I'll you know, keep an eye on that. Um, so as I was saying, your loss prevention program includes things like taking care of uh, both making and delivering and oftentimes those safety and security trainings, maintaining your emergency response finder and using that as a tool in part with your loss prevention program, but having the staff to make all of this happen is key. Even if that's one person, and even if that person's only there for 40 hours a week, that's better than not having anybody. What we've noticed a lot is that the loss prevention responsibilities, whatever they may be, get spread out amongst a few different people and then they don't get really done very well. They're not streamlined, there's, not, there's no cohesion, there's no communication, and so a lot of stuff just falls through the cracks. So at the top of our list, we have loss prevention staff, responsibility, and training. Whoever that person is going to be, 
needs to be trained in what their responsibilities are, and those responsibilities need to be identified. Um, I am going to, since Paul has been at the head of loss prevention staff for both City Market Co-op and the Sacramento Natural Foods Co-op for over 12, 15 years almost now, I'm going to let Paul take it from there and outline the rest of the loss prevention program. Yeah, so just to touch a little bit uh, on the back end of what Mike was saying, the loss prevention staff, this, this doesn't have to be, you have to find what's going to work for your co-op, and every co-op is different. Obviously, we're all different sizes, different shapes, different neighborhoods. So we need to find out what works best for your store. That might be one person, like we had at City Market for five years, um, where that one person is kind of developing all this stuff, but they're also dealing with any kind of safety and security incidents that arise during the shift. But also they're tasked with providing oper operational coverage for the store. And they would jump in at a moment's notice to help out, like let's say a customer service, or if we needed to get, um, you know, a, a, a piece of salmon cut for a customer because you know the the meat meat person had to go on a break and they had a call out so you know that it's you can couple it with kind of that providing operational coverage so it's not you want it to be specific but it's a larger it could be a larger position and it might help be being able to build that out or you can make another whole whole department where which is similar to something like sacramento where we have a floor manager and then we have assistant floor managers and those folks are tasked or asked to provide the operational coverage as well as respond to any incidents that arise throughout the day. And that could be safety related incidents, it could be a, uh, you know, a mixer going down, but most frequently what's been happening lately has been theft. So having that staff in place to deal with that stuff is, is the start, identify that, but then we need to build up the program itself. So uh, let me try it for one sec. Yeah. One other reason to have dedicated staff, staff that's been trained, staff that understands the responsibilities associated with the work is so that you don't have your lay staff jumping in where they're not trained to do things. That's what you really want to avoid. You don't want your cashiers chasing someone down who's stealing or approaching somebody and accusing them of stealing um, or any of those various things or responding to an emergency they're unprepared for. You want the dedicated staff who has that training to do that. Those people, all the other people, all your other staff will play a role within your loss prevention program, but they're not the primary folks who take responsibility for those larger issues. Yeah, they're the, the biggest role that your other staff um, play. And for, in, for, for an example, you know, we see in a lot of stores when there is a safety or security incident that happens, uh, we got a lot of onlookers from our staff. A lot of the staff really want to run into the area and see what's going on. I get that a lot from front end folks because they see everything that happens right in front of the store. And what I tell people is your role in an incident that's happening like this is to provide the best customer service you can to our customers that are at the registers. We want to make sure that our customers are getting the best service they can and they are unaware of anything else that's happening at that front door when we're stopping somebody for theft. That's their role and that's really what I try to what I try to coach everybody on. But we do need to establish um, security policies and guidelines and what works for your store and that could look uh, that could be something as, as you could already have some of those policies in place but putting them all together into one cohesive document. So almost like your department's directives, these are the, the rules that we need to follow with regards to safety and security, how to make stops, when it's appropriate to make stops. Um, do we use handcuffs? Do we use physical force? All of that stuff gets laid out in what we call our security policies and guidelines. And it, it runs the gamut of anything that could come up. What do we do with evidence? Do we photograph shoplifters? What do we do? How do we deal with bad checks or counterfeit currency? Um, which also talks about, which, which relates back to our trainings that we did last week. So again, very detailed uh, coverage of our policies and guidelines that our loss prevention staff are tasked to follow. So, so once we stop, time, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, we do this as it, it, for two reasons. One, the exercise of creating this document, whether you work with us to create it, which we do, and we created this one for Willimantic, or you work within your own store to create it yourself, that exercise itself helps you establish your guidelines and how you want to approach things. Things like handcuffs, almost no co-op is gonna say, yeah, we wanna use handcuffs. 
you may say it's appropriate for um, outside um, security guards that you hire to use handcuffs. You also may say, no, it's not. You have the authority to say those things and you get to dictate how you want things to look. Um, handcuffs is an extreme example, but maybe touching somebody, maybe, maybe you don't want to stop anybody in your store. You just want to call the police every time. You sat in a room, you made that decision. Codifying that in a document does a couple of things. A, you worked through it yourselves and you understood your community, your neighborhood, your customers, your members, your staff, and everything that their expectations lead you to want to do. And then let's say you leave or the loss prevention staff leaves, you have this document. So you'll have consistency going forward. So uh, I like to point out this little section of situations warning and notice of trespass. I think it's really all encompassing. I hope you guys were seeing it on the screen while, while we were talking, but um, it really lays out those instances in which it's a, we feel it's appropriate or we've decided as a co-op that it's appropriate to issue somebody a notice of trespass. Um, some, some stores, like Mike said, don't want to do that stuff. We just want to recover the product and just and, and, and tell the person that's not okay, just kind of stay away. Uh, but we might need a more, um, a more robust system for doing that. Um, so that's just an example of that. Once we have our policies and guidelines, we need to make sure that our, that our staff that are, that are tasked with approaching people or just observing these incidents are trained. So not to just get on, we created this, we created that, but there is this, there, there are, and it doesn't have to come from us, but there are surveillance and observation trainings as well as apprehension trainings depending on how deep you want to take your loss prevention program to really, that really trains our staff, our staff tasked with these, with these, um, with that work on how to properly um, surveil and observe for theft. And then beyond that, an extension is how to safely apprehend folks for, set, for theft and process them so that we recover the product, we identify the person and either trespass them or not. So, there are things out there that do that. Um, this isn't the only one, so I just wanted to show you an example of that as well. Not all of your staff, um, even your loss prevention staff, will need trainings like this. There's roles and responsibilities within your loss prevention program that will require, that doesn't require this depth of kind of training. What they'll need to be trained on is how to respond to incidents in the store, how to document those incidents, how to record those incidents, um, and then how to, you know, what the next steps are. So a lot of the folks that Paul works with, with, with his group of folks are doing that. They're filling out paperwork, they're taking calls, follow-up calls from staff, and they're following up on a lot of stuff. And they're, you know, currying those things where they need to go um, so that those, all those incidents can be responded to effectively. And ideally, the more you're doing this effectively, the, the, the more you're actually curtailing um, safety and sec your security incidents in the store. So the this key to all of this, all showing is pretty advanced. The key to all of this, your whole loss prevention program is organization, assigned responsibility, diligence and commitment. The co-op has to make a commitment to this type of work. Uh, we have to assign responsibilities to the right folks. And we have to organize the entire, the entire pro um, program. Um, so there's, you know, from the, um, where did I have it? We'll say this just so just while Paul's pulling this up. One thing we've noticed is that, that we've had, you know, clients reach out to us. They want to do this stuff. We give them a lot of tools. Maybe it's trainings. Maybe it's a written policies guideline. Um, maybe it's, you know, some tools to help them in, 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 uh, install some of the physical components. And if they don't have dedicated staff, a lot of that just gathers dust. So they got all the tools, they spent some time and money on those tools, and then they don't have the dedicated person to do it. Your GM's too busy, your store manager might be able to take on one extra thing, but not most of it. They couldn't identify the person or a few people that are going to devote themselves to it. You look at your staff, you're like, okay, my facilities person, you know, might be able to take some of this on. Maybe I, maybe I couch this under facilities, or maybe I do couch it under my floor manager position. Find the position and then charge them with the responsibilities to go through the rest of this and make it actually worthwhile. So what other physical components make up your loss prevention program? Um, 
hopefully if we're if we're fortunate enough in our stores to have a robust camera system um and i'm going to roll in here uh a le camera layout that was done for middlebury natural foods co-op when they did their renovation their remodel they were able to add some cameras let me do a full screen on this shut the whole thing that uh, makes it a little bit smaller but as you can see, all the cameras are laid out, very robust, very thoughtful layout uh, of the camera so that we can cover as much of the store as possible. Um, looks like we have a question here, Mike. How many cameras is that, Paul? Oh, so this is a total of, well, they had pre-runs, they had wires pre-run for 27. We added 27 more camera locations. So what's, 27 27 so those are your two favorite numbers paul yeah. <laughs> so you know it depends on the size of the cameras. store city market if anybody's been in the downtown city market it's a 1600 square no 1200 square foot retail that store had about 50 to 55 cameras in it um was it enough it, it worked right i didn't have a camera down every aisle of the store which is always nice but it worked for what i needed in that little small store Sacramento, for instance, we have over a hundred cameras in, in Sacramento. Now that does include our our uh, our parking garage, which has about four to five cameras per floor. But um, we try to cover as much as we can there. This was, and it's also scalable with cameras. So what I always suggest to people is, when you're initially putting in a camera system, I'll, I'll talk about this really quick. When we initially put in a camera system go for a system that can accommodate more than what you're uh, uh, initially planning to do and also run cable for more than you're initially planning to do the the cost in run in in putting cameras out one of the biggest costs is running the cable especially when the building is already built and the infrastructure is already there it makes it a lot more difficult to run cable but you're paying a lot for that labor so if you can run it all at the same time and you have extra drop lines around the store then you can very easily buy a 500 cable pop it up in the ceiling, plug it in, it's, it's, it's plug, and, plug and play basically at that point. So think about that when you're thinking about camera systems. And I, we can go into a lot more detail about camera systems, but I'm just not gonna do that right now. I uh, just wanted to show you an example of that. What else do we need for uh, our, our physical components, a physical workstation? Where are we gonna be doing this work? Where are we gonna be reviewing some of the video? But also where, if we are choosing to stop somebody for shoplifting, where would we do that? Um, Ideally, that's a private office with a door you can close and lock that has a camera inside and that you can keep sterile, which means no staplers or phones or, or um, scissors on the desk. But um, so think about that. Where would you actually process somebody if we had to stop them for shoplifting? Where's a safe place to do that? That's not necessarily in public view, but not necessarily totally in private. So think about that. Your loss prevention drive, this is your digital folder structure. So every incident that comes up, you, you open up your desktop, you have a couple folders on your, on your desktop here. I got an incident folder shortcut already, already set up for everybody to show. So I open up my incident folder. Every incident that happens in the store gets an incident folder. So I'm gonna open up 2020. We're in February, it's gonna be blank. It's gonna be empty because I don't have any incidents. But guess what, we had an incident today where, um, we had somebody steal some some wine, so there's my incident folder for a beer and wine theft that just happened today. And we didn't catch the person, so I'm just doing an alert on them. Um, but I got to go into my forms and I got to make make an alert for that person. At Sacramento Natural Foods Co-op, we call alerts bolos, which is a be on the lookout. I prefer alert, but bolo works just fine. You would go here, you would you would paste the picture of the person, you would go here, you put the date, right? The name or you know, wine theft. Great. We have a picture of the person. We're gonna save this to that folder, right? Desktop, do this super quick. Find my folder. Whoops. I'm sorry. I cut instead of copying. Open that. There, now my alerts saved to my folder, as you can see. And then I can print it out. I can put it in my trespass or my alert binder so that my frontline staff can see that alert uh, when they're perusing through the binder. So that's just a really quick example of how these, this folder structure works. If you have a customer accident or injury, if you have an employee accident or injury, 
those should all have their own incident folders. And you should save, review and save the video for all of those incidents. Uh, you don't want to go crazy because you don't want to save terabytes and terabytes of video, but you do want to have some of that evidence in case somebody something comes up later and we need to re review back to that. Another way for you to track some of these incidents um, is in my incident folder here, I got an incident tracking log. And this is actually filled out um, almost up to date, right, from the 16th of February of we capture all of these incidents that happen in our store um, and we carry we, we capture a lot of demographic information so that we can really pull some data and say okay what days of the week are our most well how many what days of the week are we having the most incident what time of the day that will help us inform our scheduling for our loss prevention and staff um, what types of incidents um, what category or incident type what did, what do we do with it are they a member or are they are they our community member right so all this information is helpful for us to really inform our uh, what we're doing in the store, um, but also it helps us track these incidents if we have to go back and find something that happened about six months ago. I just wanted to point out that this is part and parcel of why we recommend a camera system and how that's actually being actively used in the store. When Paul talked about putting a photo on the bolo, he would pull that photo as still image from the video. If there's a trip and fall, he'll follow the video back before that happened to see if there was something in the aisle that somebody after, excuse me, actually tripped over or who might have left it there if somebody was able, if somebody did that. Um, all that stuff he gets to document. So his job is the job I'm talking about that people don't have the time for oftentimes. So having somebody dedicated to doing that, you can see it takes some time. He has to go to the video, he has to go back in the video, he has to record video create these incident reports. At the start of your program, you need to build these forms. You need to build this structure. So Paul's showing you right now the different kinds of forms that we have, um, we've created that Paul uses every day. Some of them, like we talked about earlier, security follow-up forms are available in all your emergency response binders. So any staff person um, that sees an incident they want to report to Paul or to your loss prevention staff can fill one out. Um, if there's um, an injury, same thing. They know those forms are there. We lump everything together, safety and security. So like I said, those cameras are not just for observing for theft. Uh, they're observing for harassment, trips and falls, accidents, anything. So you're constantly on top of that. Having somebody dedicated doing this is, is pretty critical. As you can see, it's a lot more work than it seems like, oh, I'm just going to, I see somebody stealing, let's just go talk to them. Yeah, and some of this stuff, if you depending on if you have a, a an alert or a bolo or a trespass, um, every incident takes time, but some of them take a lot longer than others. If we're searching a lot of videos, saving a lot of videos, saving a lot of still shots, got to create a lot of forms. Some of our some of my incident folders really have like six or seven items in here, even including if they're a member, I'm going to pull some of their member information so I have that documented as well. Um, if they're a trespass, I create a trespass form. And I put that in a trespass binder, similar to our alert binder to alert staff. These are a collection of people that aren't welcome back in our store. Um, just want to show real quick a copy of our, hopefully, hopefully everybody's seen something like this um, or has something like this, a security follow-up form. This is really, we keep this at customer service. We keep it in emergency response binders. We keep them at all the registers too. This is really for our staff to communicate issues that they see to us so that we can look into it, use the camera system, follow up, then follow back up with the employee to tell them what happened and what the result of that incident that they reported to us um, that they felt was important for us to know about. So that's that helps with that communication and that buy-in from all staff. Um, I wanted to point out, I think the, we're running out of time here. So one of the last few things we're gonna talk about is that you have some physical components, you have your security guide policies and guidelines, you have this whole infrastructure that Paul's talking about right now, um, and you have that sort of actively happening in your store. The other thing, the other big part of your loss prevention program is, is connecting with local stakeholders in your community, not just your members and not just your staff, but outside of that. Your, your store is not experiencing this stuff in a vacuum. Other stores in the neighborhood are experiencing issues as well. There's all kinds of issues in your community that are contributing to this. You also have to build a relationship with local law enforcement. Maybe you probably already have one. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's not so good. 
bringing folks together, having conversations, asking questions, sharing information where necessary, where appropriate, working with um, very specific local stakeholders, maybe it's mental health workers in your community, um, homeless shelter workers in your community. Uh, City Market in downtown Burlington had a unique relationship with a downtown organization. What were they called, Paul? The Howard Church Center Street. for Mental Health. Church, but no, the Church Street folks that would... Yeah. Um, Howard Center Church Street Team for Mental so Health. So yeah, there was like a street team that worked, you know, would connect with Paul. Oh, we saw so-and-so in the store today. They were creating a scene over here. You know, I think they went that way. Street team or Howard Center might approach and work with them on their issues and stuff like that. It's a constantly moving, Paul can tell you before we got on the call today, he was saying it every day, constantly stuff he's responding to. It's not just theft and it's not just injuries. It's often a lot of mental health stuff folks are dealing with, a lot of itinerant homeless um, things people are dealing with, panhandling. I mean, Paul could probably go on for days about all this stuff, but he's actively working with this all day. If you don't have somebody to, we have people calling us all the time and saying we have issues with this, issues with that. Well, who do you have dealing with it? Well, who's ever available at the moment kind of talks to them. It, it just isn't, it isn't robust enough. It isn't streamlined enough to, to actually make any kind of dent in what you're you know, doing. With, with some of your community um, partnerships, um, obviously the police are a big one. The mental health organizations, homeless organizations, you know, one thing to consider is um, do, does the police department or do the other organizations know what you're dealing with at your store? Do they know what resources you have available at your store? So for instance, yesterday I had a de police detective come by the store because there was a, a hit and run that happened about a block away from us at an intersection. And he wanted to see if we had cameras to, that covered it. Sure enough, we had cameras that along our entire back of the building and we were able to see that entire intersection off of a camera off our parking garage. And I invite them in, I say, anytime you guys need video or anything that happens, anything around our store, we're more than happy to give you whatever you need. Um, I don't tell them they need to come with a subpoena or a warrant or anything like that. Like we're helping, we're, we're part of the same community. And so we should be helping them in that way. And I do, and I feel pretty strongly about that. Consider, you know, one thing I've been working on for a while is, is doing some sort of like open house where I invite the police department, police officers to come stop by on their lunch breaks or to get a bite, a bite to eat. But while they come in, they're going to get a little presentation on what is a co-op because a lot of the officers don't even know that. How does the co-op contribute to this, to the, to a healthful community that they're helping, that they're, that they're working in as well. And then what resources are available to them? You know, show them that camera system, show them how robust it is and how good cameras we have so that we can help them out if they have something going on. Consider you're also wanting to you're also wanting to help them understand what your needs are. Yep. Um, and so the the more open you are to them, you know, the more hopefully responsive they'll be to your needs as well. If you need quicker response times, we've talked to co-ops that don't get response times for over an hour for incidents. Sometimes it's really quick. Bigger cities, smaller cities, um, you know, understanding the police capacity and all that stuff. We've also dealt with cities and towns who don't want to deal with the police at all. And so we try to work through some of that issue. We understand people's skepticism about inviting A, camera systems into your store and B, working with police in, in many ways. As Paul's saying, he feels really strongly about it. Building that relationship is pretty important. If you're gonna trespass people and they're unenforceable, they're, people are just gonna walk back in your store. You don't have the authority to really do much beyond that. You know, It is not a perfect system holistically, but we create within our stores, the best system we can to provide the safest, safest and most secure co-op for our staff and community. And then we work with outside stakeholders, ideally to create a more you know, safe and secure community for everybody. And hopefully that's working and we're always working to improve that system. It is just now 1.30. We lost Jennifer a few minutes ago. Um, we're not, uh, we don't necessarily have to walk away right now. Paul has to get, but if you have anything you wanted to ask us right now, again, chime in here, hit us up on email, um, give us a call sometime. We'd love to chat more about it with you. Um, we hope to have a, uh, another one of these down the road where we just sit and talk about what issues you dealt with, you're dealing with, and what questions you have. So look for uh, us to set something like that up sooner than later. Paul, anything? No, I want to thank you both for sticking around, sticking through to the end. Um, 
again, if you have any questions, let us know anytime here or email. We're available. Um, and I hope I hope that your your stores are safe and no incidents and <laughs> we all have just stress free days. We just blasted through a lot of that stuff, but yeah, like I said, if you want to hear any more about it, just let us know. We have, you know, all kinds of information we can share with you. So uh, don't hesitate to hit us up. And cool. yep, that was Astrid, I think. So Daniel, I sent you an email. If you can still hear me, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, if you want to talk about, you know, any of these things you've got going on, we can, uh, I'm actually not that far from you. So I'm familiar with the Brattleboro Food Co-op, Paul is as well. Um, hit us up. We'll talk more about it. Sound good, Paul? Wrap it up? Yep. yep. All right. Thank cheers. You. Thank you.